Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece here with video D on the integumentary system. We're going to focus this time on the dermis. So we've pretty much wrapped up the epidermis. We're moving on to the dermis in this video D. Unlike the epidermis, which you learned was all stratified squamous epithelial tissue with melanocytes as well and some Langerhans cells and Merkel cells in there, the dermis is all connective tissue. But we're going to see that it's made up of two different types of connective tissue. Just deep to the epidermis, we're going to see our loose areolar connective tissue. And as we go further into, or as we go deeper into the dermis, we're going to end up into dense irregular connective tissue. And these two <clears throat> sublayers have names. And let me switch pens here, pen colors here. So the tissue that makes up the areolar connect, I'm sorry, the layer that makes up the areolar connective tissue, we will refer to as the papillary layer. While the layer of dense irregular connective tissue we will call the reticular layer. So let, now let's take a look. We call the papillary layer the papillary layer because we see papilla-like structures. I'm pointing to them now. It's hard for you to see my red cursor, but that's the only color I can use. Papilla in Latin means nipple-like. So here is a papilla, and here is a papilla, and here is a papilla. So the dermis doesn't form a flat connection with the epidermis. And obviously this increases surface area, and the dermis can hold on to the epidermis a bit easier. But the increased surface area is going to allow for many more nutrients to be able to reach, and gas in the form of oxygen, of course, to reach the epidermis, and vice versa, wastes from the epidermis, carbon dioxide, can make it into the connective tissues where the blood vessels can carry away these wastes. So these papilla are important to increase surface to help anchor the epidermis, and they also create little nooks and corners for another sensory receptor that we will introduce you to in just uh, in one of the next slides. So that's why that's called the papillary layer. The dense irregular connective tissue is called reticular because it looks very web-like or very network-like or very meshed, mesh, a mesh work of, of all kinds of fibers because it's made up of all three fibers, collagen, elastic, as well as reticular fibers. We see that the dermis is what holds most of the accessory structures, including the hair follicles and the, 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 the two different glands, the oil and the sweat glands, in addition to blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerve vessels. I say nerve fibers, but you could call them nerve vessels. <clears throat> As a little side note, the dermis is what we actually often refer to as the hide when leather is made. And finally, here before I forget, the collagen fibers that we find in the dermis, of course, provide strength to our skin. It makes our skin look nice and tight. Uh, when we get older, we lose a lot of collagen and our skin gets kind of wrinkly looking, not so appealing. Um, so the collagen fibers provide that strength and resilience. See, and also they bind water, so it becomes more and more difficult as we get older to hold on to water in our skin, also contributing more and more to its more wrinkly look. And so again, the papillary layer is going to be where we find the areolar connective tissue, while the reticular layer is what's where we find our dense irregular connective tissue, 
with collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and even reticular fibers. So this figure nicely illustrates the, the bumps formed here by the dermis as it connects to the epidermis. And of course those bumps are your dermal papillae, singular dermal papilla with just the letter A. And I mentioned earlier they increase the surface area, uh, create little nooks and corners for um, various touch receptors and pain receptors to be located. And we see that little capillary beds can hang out there, again, of course, making it much easier for nutrients and wastes to exchange. Now, one more thing to add to, about these dermal papillae, and aside from them increasing surface area to create space for the receptors and capillaries, etc., is that they, <coughs> excuse me, they are responsible for creating the epidermal ridges in the epidermis. We can call these epidermal ridges or also friction ridges. So when you look at the tips of your fingers or the bottoms of your feet, they have all those little circular lines on them, and those are your epidermal or friction ridges. Now, when you touch something, let's say you place your fingertips on, a, on the counter on a piece of glass, you leave behind fingerprints as a result of these epidermal ridges. These epidermal ridges are genetically determined, so your epidermal ridges are very different from mine. So here we see a fingerprint that is the result of the epidermal ridges present on somebody's finger. We've also, our researchers have also found that these epidermal ridges allow us to grip things better. Believe it or not, all of these little ridges allow us to grip, hold on to things better, and they increase our, um, our sense of touch as well. Now let's take a quick look here at the three major pigments, color pigments that we find in the skin. And you've already heard me talk about melanin, which is produced by melanocytes. And there's actually two forms of melanin. One is more of a reddish yellow, while the other one is more of a brownish black. And remember, we find it not only in the skin, but also in our hair and in our eyes. And as we all know, the more we are out in the sun, the darker we tend to get. So somehow our, the sun tends to trigger more activity in our melanocytes. But what is interesting is that as humans, we all tend to have pretty much the same number of melanocytes. There's really not that much difference in the amount of melanocytes between a very dark-skinned person and a very light-skinned person. So <clears throat> what we do find is that in dark-skinned people, the melanocytes are much, much more active compared to in light-skinned people. And of course, this is all genetically determined. In addition to melanin, our skin contains uh, another pigment that we call carotene. So this is not to be confused with keratin, which we learned about earlier. Keratin is a protein. Carotene is not. So we'll also say it is not a protein. If you look at the spelling of carotene, then you see the word carrot in it, and that will help you remember uh, to distinguish it from keratin. This is the pigment that actually gives carrots their color. You feed your little baby enough carrots, uh, a lot of that carotene pigment will deposit in its skin and it'll give your baby a, a kind of an orange -ish tint. You can give uh, little birds, uh, canaries as they're called, car carrots to give them a, a much brighter uh, color as well. So many, many of our um, yellow, orangish veggies are going to have this pigment. And it tends to deposit, especially in the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. This is an important pigment, by the way, because it can be converted to vitamin A, which is important for our vision. 
Finally, there is hemoglobin. And of course, hemoglobin is present in our blood. And it is what makes up our red blood cells. So it is a protein that is found inside of our red blood cells. Red blood cells are not even cells anymore. They have literally given up all of their organelles and their nucleus to just allow for this hemoglobin protein to take over. So red blood cells are just lots of little sacs of millions and millions and millions of molecules of hemoglobin. Now when hemoglobin, Hb for hemoglobin, binds oxygen, it forms something we call oxyhemoglobin. There's a little bit more to it, but that's good enough. And it'll be bright red. On the other hand, if oxyhemoglobin loses its oxygen, minus oxygen, then we get a very dark red hemoglobin. It would be called deoxyhemoglobin, by the way. You'll learn more about that later on. So it'll be a very dark, dark red. So the, the, depending on how much oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, we will have a nice pinkish color to our skin versus a much um, unhealthier look. And the, the low levels of oxygen give us more of a bluish color based on how the uh, light plays with the pigmentation of our skin. This is why when you go into surgery, you're asked to not wear makeup, certainly not nail polish, because your nails and your lips, for instance, um, they can very quickly indicate, based on their color, uh, whether your oxygen levels are rapidly dropping or not. And so this wraps up our discussion for video 5D. As a final slide here, just as a reminder, Dark-skinned, light-skinned people, we all have about the same number of melanocytes, but in light-skinned people, we're going to find that the melanocytes are not all that active, and therefore they're not going to deposit as many granules along uh, inside of the keratinocytes. If we compare that to dark-skinned people, we see a lot more melanin deposited inside of the keratinocytes, and that's what creates the difference in the skin color. And as I mentioned, this is, of course, all genetically coded for. So this is the end of video 5D.